Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday plenary session. There will be another plenary session on Thursday. This is a wonderful opportunity to bring everybody together for just a couple of hours to hear something that everyone is really interested in. That's how we decide that it is a plenary. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Tracy Wigner from the University of Hawaii at Hilo, who will introduce our first plenary speaker. Tracy? Aloha. Aloha! It is my great pleasure to introduce our first plenary speaker for the Ocean Science Meeting, Dr. Bob Richmond. He is a research professor and director at the University of Hawaii at Manoa's Kivala Marine Laboratory. Dr. Richmond received a PhD from SUNY Stony Brook and subsequently was a postdoc fellow at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. Following, he spent 18 years on the faculty at the University of Guam Marine Laboratory. He studies coral reefs from the Caribbean to the Pacific. He is the president of the International Society for Reef Studies and the science advisor for the All Island Committee of the U.S. Coral Reef Task Force. And he is a science advisor for the Joint Ocean Commission Initiative. He is both an Aldal Leopold Fellow in Environmental Leadership and a Pew Fellow in Marine Conservation. He works closely with community-based organizations. This includes elected and traditional leaders, as well as stakeholders, and he has trained over 50 Pacific Islanders in his laboratory. His research interests include coral reef ecology, marine conservation, ecotoxicology, eco, eco, eh, eco, uh, <laughs> uh, eco he bridges science to management and policy, the integration of traditional ecological knowledge with modern approaches to resource use and protection. My favorite thing that I read about him is that his childhood fascination with Dr. Doolittle helped inspire his approach to studying coral reefs. By listening to the corals and the coral reef organisms um, using ecological indicators and molecular biomarkers. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Bob Richmond. Mahalo. Aloha kako. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers of the meeting for the opportunity to present before you today uh, on a subject uh, over which I've been working for the past uh, close to 40 years now. Um, the title, Coral Reefs, Climate Change and Atomic Bombs, might be a little confusing, but Hopefully I'll be able to clarify that pretty quickly. What I'd really like to do is focus in on uh, where coral reefs are today and the importance of using the science of coral reefs to be able to help affect policy um, to go beyond the outputs to achieve some very important outcomes. Um, I started working on coral reefs back in the 1970s, like a whole cohort of us. Uh, we remember seeing coral reefs, uh, certainly in the Caribbean, with uh, beautiful uh, forests of staghorn corals and elkhorn corals. In the upper left-hand coral we, uh, corner, we see a beautiful Acropora palmata. And when I first started working in the Caribbean, I remember these beautiful forests. Um, just below that, on the lower left-hand side, we see a Pacific Reef when I started working on them about 35 years ago. And unfortunately, there's been a major shift in most coral reefs from uh, what we see on the left over to what we see on the right. Uh, what I'd really like to focus in on then is how some of the science that we're working on today will hopefully ensure that uh, less of the good reefs end up on the right side and more of the reefs that are already in a degraded state can head back towards a state where they're totally functional and can not only serve as beautiful coral reefs but also help the people who depend on them. Um, the photos here on the detonations of the hydrogen bombs, uh, it's tied to me personally in the way um, I spent two years working in the Marshall Islands where I did my doctoral research and was able to see the after effects of this nuclear testing. Um, the uh, picture on the left uh, on the upper side is from the Bravo detonation that occurred in 1954. Uh, the expectation was about four to eight uh, megatons of yield and it turned out to be uh, between three to five times that amount. 
Uh, I often hear students in my laboratory using four-letter words. Uh, the one that always worries me the most is oops, and when I hear that, I know there's something seriously wrong. These photographs really demonstrate what the uh, extent of oops can really be. Notice under the mushroom cloud and uh, on the expanding cloud on the bottom right that there are ships there. Some were put there as testing to see what would happen. Others were actually containing individuals that were observers. And um, what I've seen then from my work, and starting in 1980 where I uh, moved to the Marshall Islands and began my studies at Enoetok Atoll, there was the testing ground for many of the uh, nuclear tests. Uh, on the upper left-hand side, we see two hydrogen bomb craters about a mile in diameter and 150 feet deep. Just below that, there's the uh, Runnet uh, Dome, which is actually a concrete structure overtopping one of the atomic bomb craters where a lot of nuclear waste was put. Uh, it's a very interesting story for those that are um, interested in the history of the nuclear testing program called Brighter Than a Thousand Suns, but it's also a real wake-up call about how science can sometimes end up with these kinds of oops moments. The relevance to what I want to present today is the fact that uh, on the gradient of human impacts on coral reefs, uh, vaporization due to nuclear testing is pretty extreme. But when we take a look at uh, the common things that are uh, responsible for coral reef destruction and demise today, um, in the upper left-hand corner, erosion and sedimentation, uh, coastal pollution, on the bottom we see a sewer outfall, which is in 60 feet of water. Um, off the coast of New York, 60 feet of water is about two miles out. Um, this particular plume in 60 feet of water is only about um, 100 feet offshore. And this is a great concern of what we're doing in terms of coastal water quality. In the upper right-hand corner, we see uh, the effects of overfishing, especially of herbivores. And with ever-expanding recreational impacts, we can see that while these may seem mundane, the previous slides I showed of the nuclear testing, um, in those sites we actually see coral recovery occurring. In the slides that I'm showing here, um, rarely do we see coral surviving and or recovering from this combination of chronic exposure to sediment, uh, reductions in coastal water quality, overfishing leading to uh, alternate stable states of fleshy algae, and continued recreational impacts. Uh, this is a picture of uh, one of our rescue dogs, Momo, who is an Aussie Shepherd. Um, I'm always interested in genetics, and it's amazing to see that with no training whatsoever, he truly is a herder. If he could have a tattoo, I'm sure it would say born to herd. And everything that he does in life is around getting things that move to go in the direction that he wants. Um, the first time I took him for a walk after we adopted him, he saw the uh, fleet of buses heading to the North Shore um, on a weekend uh, full of tourists. And he stared at those buses and you could tell exactly what he was thinking, that there must be a way of directing them and herding them. Um, from my perspective, and for uh, many of us who have talked about the importance of bridging science to policy, I often feel that we have the same mindset. Uh, I don't know if the verb to use would be hurting, but certainly nudging or guiding somehow policymakers to be able to use the knowledge that we have in an effective manner to help uh, determine the future, not only of coral reefs, but the state of our ocean and the state of our world. Uh, maybe, like my dog, we're biting off a little bit more than we can chew, or uh, we have great expectations, but still the concept of using science to affect national policies that make sense in achieving appropriate outcomes is a worthwhile uh, effort. Uh, to try to give you an analogy using something of local culture, uh, this is Spam Masubi. Um, if you have not been out to Hawaii or you don't know what this is, um, it's a very important food staple and delicacy in Hawaii. And I use it as an analogy to show how different things can come together to achieve hopefully a worthwhile uh, output and an outcome. To me, the science is like the uh, rice. That's the foundation. And um, in the case here, you can see a little bit of the furukake. The different colors there may represent the different disciplines, a little bit of geoscience, a little bit of social science. Um, but what we're very concerned about is then a solid foundation of good science. Uh, the little egg piece in there to me represents management, and it's a very clear and easy transition from science to management. I'm sure we're all familiar with very good scientists who do management and very good managers that do science. So that transition has pretty well been established. The uh, frontier that remains is really being able to bridge science to policy. And to me, that's the spam piece with the politics. Um, it's the meat byproduct that we're not really quite sure exactly what it is. We're not sure we actually want to know either. 
but nonetheless the politics are a very big part of the science and the management moving towards policy and uh, if it's done properly and wrapped together as a package the hope is that you have policy outcomes that can actually do the good that we all hope for. Um, on the science portion, we already know a lot about coral reefs and many of my studies have been tied to uh, corals and how coral reefs persist over time. In this first segment, we see a daytime spawning of corals where they're releasing their egg and sperm into the water. Um, in the second uh, portion of the slide, we see these combined egg and sperm parcels, which include uh, the sperm from the male part of the colony, the eggs from the female. These sequential hermaphrodites, that is their male and, and females together, release these uh, clusters and interestingly enough rarely if ever do we see self-fertilization meaning the sperm from that package will simply not fertilize the eggs from the same colony. If all goes well we often see um, a beautiful embryo forming. Uh, if the water quality is good that embryo can then develop into a coral planula larva. Uh, that can take anywhere from 18 to 72 hours depending upon the egg size. If the water quality continues uh, uh, as good um, the coral larvae can then begin searching along the bottom for a suitable place to settle. And it turns out the coral larvae are not simply randomly distributed, but rather they end up uh, being induced to metamorphose by a number of compounds that can be either associated with the crustose coral analogy or more likely the microbial films associated with the crustose coral analogy. And again, for most of the corals that we study that have this external spawning, uh, ability, they must pick up their symbiotic algae, that is their zooxanthellae from the external environment. The point I wish to make is that the science of coral reef persistence is well known. Um, the cycle of six steps is absolutely critical to produce the larvae that can then recruit and become part of the reef for the future. And the point I want to make is that if you break any one of these links, uh, everything cascades down into decline. Um, if we look at the first four parts, the spawning, egg sperm interactions, embryological development to the larval stage, these are particularly sensitive to water-soluble compounds, whereas the last two stages are very sensitive to what we call lipophilic substances, that is the ones that are most sticky and uh, are likely PAHs and pesticides. Um, if we look at this as an entire cycle, uh, we also recognize in the face of climate change and ocean acidification, that fifth step with the crustose coral and algae, uh, we know these crustose coral and algae are very susceptible to ocean acidification, likewise uh, the biological films that are associated with them. And in this picture you can clearly see what I'm talking about, whereas the water quality is impaired to the point where fertilization and development could not occur, and obviously the bottom is so covered uh, that the larvae could not get the metamorphic inducer necessary for them to settle metamorphose and become part of the future reef. One of the problems we face with corals in both the assessment and monitoring phase is the use of mortality as the endpoint. And what I mean by that is that it doesn't leave a whole lot of room for management when you're using uh, the death of an organism as the indicator that something is wrong. If we use the same particular system for humans, nobody would be arguing about Obamacare. There would be two categories of people, alive and dead, and there would really be nothing in between. The question for a lot of us became, could we do a better job of helping to diagnose what's going on on a coral reef uh, using uh, environmental forensic tools and using medical tools to be able to identify stress before mortality occurred and then use these tools to be able to guide mitigation efforts at getting the reef back into a healthy state. Um, kind of the catchphrase of our laboratory is mortality is a rather crude indicator of stress. Um, if we, uh, all of us experience stress during the course of a day, but if I come home after a long day's work and I tell my wife and daughter I'm feeling particularly stressed and I fall over dead, chances are I've waited a little bit too long before the intervention. Uh, the concept here is to be able to do things that we do in human medicine, blood tests, cholesterol, etc., to identify a problem because it, uh, before it ends up as a mortality event. Um, here's where the reference in the introduction to Dr. Doolittle comes in. Um, my fascination with Dr. Doolittle was not that he could talk to the animals. Um, I have both a couple of dogs and a daughter, and I talk to them a lot. It doesn't seem to have a great deal of effect. Um, but what's more important about Dr. Doolittle is the listening component, that he could actually listen to the animals. And for those of us that are concerned about uh, scientific communication, we all understand that listening is one of the most important elements of communication of any, uh, any type. 
In this particular slide, we see four examples of what I mean by Dr. Doolittle Science or Environmental Forensics, where each one of these panels demonstrates something that's very evident in terms of the reef trying to communicate back with us. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, we see what used to be a coral. Um, it now looks more like a chia pet. Uh, what we see is a clear example of too many nutrients and not enough herbivores. Um, to the right of that, on the upper right-hand side, something that's a little bit more subtle, um, that red uh, band that you see there is actually part of a uh, crab that lives symbiotically with the uh, coral colony. Uh, the coral gets protection from the crab if a crown of thorns starfish, uh, which is a coralivore, tries to climb on top and eat the coral, the crabs will protect it. In, res uh, in repayment, uh, the crab gets a very nice place to live as well as some lipid to feed upon. And we can use this again as a Dr. Doolittle moment that if we see uh, the coral but it's missing its crabs and or shrimp and other crustaceans, it's usually an indication of a pesticide problem. Uh, crabs are arthropods just like cockroaches and uh, termites and they're much more sensitive to pesticides than the coral host. So when we do see events where the coral colonies look good uh, but their crustacean symbionts are missing, it's a way in which the reef is communicating with us. In the lower left-hand side, we see a feather duster worm, a sibelid. Uh, those, like their um, close cousins, the Christmas tree worms, are indicators of a lot of nutrient input and going from uh, ligotrophic to eutrophic, where you, in fact, see a lot of uh, particulate organic carbon. If you see a shift and a lot of these worms show up, it's a real indication that water quality has been degraded as well. And finally, we see the example in the lower right-hand side of a coral larval recruit and the position, uh, the number of recruits, the size of the recruits can also be very telling of the state of the reef, not only now, but as a predictor of the future. But there's an actual metamorphic induction that goes on um, that's tied most likely to the microbial community. And for those here, and I know many of you are studying ocean acidification, ocean acidification is not only affecting the crustose coral and algae that is uh, inducing the coral larvae to metamorphose, but also the bacterial films. The microbes is where a lot of the action is occurring. So let me talk a little bit then about how in a number of cases we're trying to use the science to guide decision making in a way that will change. Uh, this is Mauna Lua Bay which starts at Diamond Head and goes all the way to Hawaii Kai. Uh, you can see on the upper right hand side is the Hawaii Kai Marina and then you can see a number of flags which show a gradient of uh, corals from inside near the watershed discharge to the outer portion. Our hope was that we would find some kind of break along this gradient where beyond which we wouldn't see any change in the coral response to stressors. Um, this is called a canonical correlation analysis. There won't be a test at the end. Um, and what it basically shows is two types of data. One, a biomarker, that is an enzyme or a protein that's produced by a coral. And then it's showing the coral distribution pattern. On the upper site, site N is the one closest to the discharge from the Coolio O watershed. Uh, sites 3 and 2.5 are mid-channel sites. And then sites T and K are the outer sites that I showed on the previous map. And what we see is, in fact, the corals are responding by upregulating proteins. They can also downregulate. Uh, in response to a number of stressors. And this was in direct response to a number of requests we had from managers to say, you know, with everybody pointing fingers about closing fishing, about pollution, about golf courses, about sewage, we really wish we had some real data that could guide the issue. Uh, many times everyone's pointing fingers, the manager is stuck without any real solid data to show what the main culprits are. And as the result is, they say, in the absence of data, we'll do nothing, which again is not a good choice. So what these biomarkers have done is enabled us to do things like look at, in the case of site N, MXR, which is pointing in that direction, multiple xenobiotic resistance protein, is a sure indicator of stress caused by the chemicals. Uh, number two, over by uh, the sites 3 and 2.5, we see an elevation of a group of proteins called the superoxide dismutases. Those are a clear indication of oxidative stress, and that site is characterized by a lot of mud that uh, fills up there and a lot of invasive algae. So at nighttime, when the sun goes down, so does the oxygen level and so does the pH. The ones that kind of surprised us is site T and K. I thought there would be enough oceanic influences not to interfere. And what we found is that there's something that's messing with the DNA of the coral. And we're through a process of elimination. It's very likely pool chemicals, because bromine and chlorine can, in fact, cause that. And there's a lot of houses with pools right up the slope. The way in which this is used, for those of you that don't live, eat, and breathe molecular biology, and I'm sure there's one or two of you out there, um, it's just like a blood test in a human. 
In the case of corals, uh, if you, in a case of a human, if you take a new medication, whether it be Lipitor or Viagra, they say a simple blood test will tell you if it's safe to take. They're looking for a liver enzyme. If the liver enzyme goes up, that means that you're having a toxic reaction and to stop. Um, I often use this example when I talk to students about the importance of science. As a child, I hated liver. Uh, the liver, for anybody who knows, is the site of detoxification for poisons getting into the body. And you can basically translate that as an analogy of saying it's the oil filter for the human body. As a child, I hated liver. My mom made us eat liver until I learned science. And I said, woman, you pretend that you love us, but you're making us eat the oil filter of the body. What's wrong with you? Never had to eat liver again. So it's a good way of getting kids to think about STEM education as a future. If you learn it early, you don't have to eat liver. The other question managers had is, can we use this not only to diagnose the major stressors that are affecting reef uh, in a multiple stressor system, but can we use it in a more quantitative fashion to look at the effect of stressors over these gradients and use it as a metric of change to determine is mitigation working or not. It didn't work for all of the proteins it worked on, but uh, on the, uh, all the way over to the left-hand side, we have a Maui site, which is relatively pristine, no development, it's an isolated reef. The level of the protein for detoxification is extremely low. And then if we look at the gradient of numbers we have from the left to the right, we can see from inshore to offshore, it comes down as well. So now we're developing a tool that can be used, we call it a dose response. The more stress, the higher the protein level. And now we can start to get targets and thresholds to say, if we can work together through mitigation to lower these stressors, we can look at responses hopefully within weeks to months rather than years to decades. And that again is a way of using science to help guide the policies. Um, I've had some really wonderful and unique experiences. My first five years of coral reef studies were in the Caribbean, uh, the Grenadine Islands from Grenada up to St. Vincent and up into St. Croix. And the last 35 years have been focused in on the Pacific. And the reason I put this map is to give people an idea of the size of the area and the geography. Way in the upper right-hand corner, you can see the Hawaiian Islands. Um, the areas in which I'll talk about today include the Marshall Islands, Federated States of Micronesia, Guam, Northern Marianas, and Palau, which encompass an area greater in size than the continental United States, and to the South, American Samoa. So we see a gradient of diversity from the west to the east. Um, in the case of Palau, close to 500 species of corals. Uh, Guam is about 300, Marshall Islands about 260. You get to Hawaii, you're down to about 62. So over this gradient of biodiversity, we also see a gradient of human uses. And I think that's where the sweet spot is, is that we can start to see where things are headed. Culturally, there's just some amazing things going on. The upper left-hand corner uh, is from time I spent in Sadawal Atoll. Uh, they're known for their traditional navigation. They're building a, a canoe out of mahogany. Uh, they don't use any glue or nails. It's all tied together with scented rope. And these are the best traditional navigators in the world. Mao Pialug, who some of you may be familiar with, is the navigator that came to Hawaii to ta teach the navigators for the Hokulea. That's beginning its around the world voyage soon. And they still understand ocean currents and connectivity. And we've actually tapped into that traditional ecological knowledge to look at connectivity among islands for understanding regional networks of marine protected areas. And it worked for us in Palau after a major bleaching event in 1998. We predicted that some of the recruits would be coming from Yap Atoll, which is out of that warm water. And it was the traditional navigators that showed us the current um, about a year and a half before we were able to get the satellite imagery to confirm it. Below that is an example of a fishing kite. It's made of a breadfruit leaf with pandanus spines. Um, they make these kites. They use scented rope made from coconut strands to fly this up over the reef. And instead of using fish hooks, they use muscle bands from oceanic sharks, which they dance on the surface of the water. And the only fish they can catch is a long-nosed needlefish. No bycatch. What we see is one of the most sophisticated marine management systems in the world that's enabled them to maintain their fisheries and their reefs intact for at least 500 to 1,000 years. And yet, up I run against, and yet I run up against colleagues of mine who are well-intentioned, who are heading out to the Pacific Islands saying, we're going to teach them about the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And I say, don't you dare. They still have fish. Um, so this is kind of the difference between a Western approach that we can tell people and give them policies that will make things work versus the communities that depend on these resources determining over uh, generations how to live in concert with their resources. I'll talk about four brief examples of how science has helped guide discovery and policy and its implementation in four islands, Guam, Palau, Pohnpei, and Hawaii. Uh, upper right-hand corner is the Rock Islands of Palau. 
Lower right are two of my fishing buddies from southern Guam. Over to the left is Pohnpei. And these represent, again, a gradient of human uses, traditional governance along with Western governance. And in the case of Guam and the southern area there, um, we've seen some real problems with sedimentation. This is a very small watershed uh, in the Humatic project. Uh, one of my graduate students, Austin Shelton, is working on this as we speak. And what we can see back in 1970s, Chuck Birkelin, Dick Randall, when they were doing surveys, there were corals all the way up to the very inner part of the bay. Uh, when we started doing this watershed modeling and looking at the effects of land use on coastal areas, by then there were no living corals in that first dark spot, very few living corals in the second. In the third uh, gradient spot, we have some corals that are barely living but not growing. Beyond that, they're growing but not reproducing. Beyond that, they're reproducing, but the gametes released in the water can't survive because this is rainy season when they reproduce. So you can see this gradient of effects coming out. And what we're trying to do is then work with the community to change the direction and start to move those concentric circles back toward shore. Presently, you have to go 300 meters offshore from a small watershed, four square kilometers, to come back to any live coral that are fully functional. And our goal is to work with the community in that watershed to see if we can change that. Um, one of the biggest problems we found in the lower photo, you can see burning. Uh, hunters would burn the hillsides to be able to then shoot deer and pigs, and it made it easy for them, the new shoots that would come up would attract them. And the problem was once these hillsides were denuded, tons of sediment would come in even after a small rainfall. Um, we pretty well knew who they were, and the problem was the guys from our regulatory agency said, I can put people out there, stake them out, arrest them, throw them in jail, fine them 250 bucks, and guess what? They're going to be lighting fires again the following month. So what we did was try to project with the school in the upper right-hand corner. Um, it's a small village area with maybe 20 families. Um, all 300 kids knew who the guys are that are burning. And for those of you that are parents, you know you don't want to have a bunch of five, six, seven-year-olds really mad at you for any reason. Um, I've never been able to win an argument with my daughter when she was five, and it's gotten much worse since she's a teenager. Um, so what we did was simply work through the school system of the kids to be able to infect their parents not only with every disease known to humankind and every cold and flu, but with an environmental ethic that burning within the watershed was a bad idea. And then we were able to get communities to come together and start working on restoration and this is part of what Austin has been working on. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with the uh, history of Guam and invasive species and the tree snake, that's not the world's largest tree snake. Uh, what it is is a uh, very large sediment sock. It might be one of the largest sediment socks. But it's filled with mulch and it's filled with the seed of plants that can then get hold in these areas that have been denuded. And you can see a sequence from May 2012 to December 2012 showing when these sediment socks were put out, you can begin to rehabilitate the watershed so coral conservation really does begin on land. And that's what we're able to do at the community level uh, to use our science to guide them. Um, in the case of Palau, we had a very interesting problem begin where Karor, which is the main town, uh, people were just overpopulating that area, so they were moving into the suburbs, which was Irai State. And in the lower side, you can see areas that are being filled in. These were mangrove forests being filled in with sediment to build houses. The problem was that the interface, the mangroves, were cutting about 30% of the sediment, and the microbes that are on the roots are actually very good at detoxifying certain things, including agrochemicals. And the result you can see in the upper right-hand corner, as more and more of the mangroves were being filled in, more and more sediment was burying the reef, and the fisheries were declining as well. And we were able to work with the local community there using researchers to help not only model and be able to show what was going on with the clearing of mangroves, but the fishermen knew what was going on. They were engaged in the project, and it validated what they already knew. And through the traditional governance process, we were able to get the chiefs, the women's groups, and the fishers to put a full moratorium on clearing and grading of mangroves within two weeks of the presentation. So think about it. From data presentation to policy development to implementation was two weeks. Took a little bit longer for the research. Um, that two week, after two weeks, that moratorium was in place for two years until national legislation was passed to prevent the clearing and grading of coastal mangroves. So once again, when you work within a society with traditional governance, it's amazing what you can get done. And now what we've been doing is integrating efforts to try to reduce the influences of land-based development on coastal coral reefs through food security. 
Uh, one of the things that's been a big concern for Palau, like most other islands, is the fact that they depend almost 100% on external sources for starch. Um, their fisheries are improving now that they've gone back to traditional management systems. But as a result of it, uh, we've been trying to then look at all of these uh, fallow taro fields and turn them back into useful taro fields by making them ponding basins to reduce sediment flow and water flow into the coastal area. We've worked with uh, colleagues in the communities there to change the engineering design. Typically, Palauans will plant one kind of taro in one area that's a little bit more dry tolerant, the wet one's a little bit closer to the coast. But with sea level change coming, and we've seen coastal inundation of coastal taro fields, we're able to approach food security and the effects of watershed development on coastal coral reefs in an integrated fashion that's culturally acceptable and it's actually economically feasible. Uh, these taro fields are capturing between 60 to 90 percent of the available sediment, and it's able to turn these fallow fields back into production so everybody's benefiting from it. We're trying to export this knowledge to some of the other islands. Um, in the case of Pohnpei, it's an extremely wet island. Um, it's one of the wettest islands on the face of the earth. Um, as my Palawan counterpart put it, uh, during the rainy season, it rains every day. During the dry season, it rains every other day. Um, it's about 300 inches of rain a day, uh, excuse me, a year, and, and not in a day. <laughs> that would be sea level where we're headed. Um, in the upper photo, you can see two areas of slumping. Um, their major cash crop is called sakao. Uh, some of you may know it as yangona or kava. It's a pepper plant root, and it's a narcotic. Uh, when you mix it with beer, it has a very narcotizing effect, so I've been told. Um, and the problem was because they were clearing the rainforest for the sakao development, we've seen tremendous increases in sedimentation occurring on the reef. Uh, Ennepine Village in Pohnpei had actually made a marine protected area in the lower right-hand corner. You can see a fisher family going out to fish the reef. But when the chiefs approached us about working together with them and providing the science, they found that there was no increase in fish in their marine protected area and couldn't understand why, and the answer was the sedimentation. Um, fish in general, but herbivores in particular, don't like high sediment uh, water, turbid water. They can't clear their gills, and they can also not detect uh, the predators that are coming after them because sharks and barracuda use their lateral line system, so they don't have to see their food to get it. Um, so working with this community, we were able to then help them, and through their conservation society, they used our science to move to a grow low program where they're not clearing the rainforest any longer, but moving the sakao farming down into the lower regions. Here's Mauna Lua Bay, where we're doing a lot of our work now, and if people are interested, please follow with me and my cohort of students who are not in the lab doing work today, but are here to cheer me on. <laughs> um, this is an area where we've been studying for a while the impacts of an urbanized watershed, and the answers are pretty clear. Um, here we have a upper left-hand corner showing the policy-mandated sediment screen. Does anybody think that will have any effect? None. But legally, they've done everything they have to do. It requires that a sediment screen go up. It doesn't require that the sediment screen actually work. Um, and that's a, one of my past PhD students in the audience for scale. He always likes that. He's famous now. He's the scale for that mound. Um, what we see happening is flood control is a big issue. And the Army Corps of Engineers, bless their hearts, I'm hoping some of my colleagues are here. If they have concrete, they know exactly what to do. You channelize a stream, you pour it with concrete, and you've got flood control but you have flood control at a devastating impact on coastal marine resources. So of all things, we partnered with the Army Corps of Engineers to show them what these things were doing. This was a big rainstorm in 2008. The upper watershed is in the upper left-hand corner. You can see the water going down to the first part of the concrete runway, coming down to the ocean. During that one event, we had 20 tons of sediment reach our mid-channel site that I showed you earlier with the superoxide dismutase elevation in about six hours. 20 tons of mud deposited on that reef within four to six hours. Um, this is not good. And interestingly enough, when we talk about partnerships, uh, we were invited once to talk to the Army Corps of Engineers leadership, and I was amazed they actually invited us back to say, we didn't know that. <laughs> Would you come back and talk to us again? So once again, being able to share science with managers and with policymakers has really been paying off, and we have a good thing going. Uh, modeling is also a wonderful scientific tool that we've been using. These are data uh, that Eric Wolanski and Yimnan Golgu, two of my uh, respected colleagues, have been doing under our regional NOAA-funded grant from C-Score. This is showing a track of uh, grouper larvae from a spawning aggregation in the northern part of Palau. So we're looking at the northern tip of Palau and the large uh, lagoon up there. And grouper larvae are very interesting. Um, they're not as good as corals, but, you know, fish are okay. 
Um, if you take a look at a grouper larva, its first two weeks, it's a planktonic particle. And at two weeks, the spine hardens enough that it can start directional swimming. Um, if there are cues, and the two cues that we find the fish are responding to are chemical cues, that is the taste of the reef water and the sounds of the reef. For those of you that have dove on reefs, you know that a good reef should sound like downtown Manila at rush hour. It should be this cacophony of noise of snapping shrimps and crabs. You can hear parrotfish biting the coral and grinding. So we're back to Dr. Doolittle. You can actually listen to the reef, and a lot of the traditional fishers I work with can actually sit in the water with their eyes closed and identify a lot of what's going on. And if the fish get these auditory cues and, uh, or don't get the auditory cues and the uh, taste cues, they simply drift out to sea, never to be seen again. The second simulation is showing the larvae from the exact same spawning uh, aggregation. If, in fact, the reef is fully intact and the noises are there and the taste is there, and instead of these things going out to sea, they track initially for the two weeks in the same direction, but starting at week two, they begin to orient back into the reef, and in the case of this particular model, they come in through the western pass, which is the drainage for the largest estuary in all of Micronesia. So you can see the difference here is how many of the larvae end up tracking back into the coral reef and into the lagoon, and this model has been very effective and influential by showing that if the reef within the system dies, you're not going to get recruitment. If you, in fact, keep the reef vital, you will get a 30% recruitment on a, coral, on a uh, group responding aggregation, which is phenomenal when you think of the numbers and the impact. And these data were presented then to the Chief's Council. Um, in the front table, all the way to the left is Noah Ideong. Some of you may know him. Uh, he was the Speaker of the Plow National Congress, Pew Fellow in Marine Conservation, uh, Goldman Prize winner, and in the year 2000, Earth Week issue of Time Magazine, he was identified as one of the eight heroes of the Earth. Um, he's been integrally involved in our NORA programs in the Pacific and has provided incredible guidance for us. Um, to the right of him sitting, Yemenang Golbu just got his PhD, the first Palawan with a PhD in marine sciences, Stephen Victor from the Nature Conservancy next to him. And through these discussions of locally connected individuals who can explain the science to the chiefs in Palawan within their cultural context, we've been able to see decisions made that an area that was going to be destroyed as a fishing port, which was one of the most biodiverse areas in all of Palau, is now being protected as part of a protected area network through the application of science, but through that cultural connection. One of the really nice elements of this study has shown that one of the chiefs from the very first village that we worked with where they were clearing and grading the mangroves came up to this group to meet with them when we went up to meet with them. And because of his seniority as a senior chief, he opened up the discussion by saying, we made a big mistake. We destroyed a lot of our reefs uh, inappropriately, and if you listen to these guys, you will save yourself a lot of heartache. And as a result of it, immediately the entire decision-making process was changed in a positive way. So everything I've talked about so far is showing what's going on at the local level, but we still have this huge problem going on at the global level, and we all know that is climate change. Uh, we've seen massive regional bleaching events of corals, uh, shifting over to what we call alternate stable states where algae takes over the bottom. Um, ocean acidification, there are experts in the room far better than I, and you'll be able to hear a lot of their talks here. But my biggest fear in trying to look at the big picture is we really are setting ourselves up for the Irish potato famine of coral reefs. Well, what do I mean by that? Every time we have something happening at a regional level where we have mass mortality of organisms, we're not only losing populations and individuals, but we're losing genotypes. And while we look at individuals and while we look at populations, we've not been tracking the genetic variation within populations at the local, regional, or international level. And my fear is one morning you will wake up and find a whole bunch of corals gone and not even see it coming. The Irish potato famine, for those of you uh, that don't know the full history, was really a genetic issue of raising one genetic variant, and that's where we may be headed for coral reefs. Uh, this is an illustration from Joni Cleopas's work. Um, there are a variety of versions of this, but it was basically showing at the global level uh, the Pacific Ocean, the red zone, is the area where the aragonite saturation state is maximal or optimal for coral growth back in 1995. These are the projections by the year 2040, and that is a huge concern. So while we're working at the local level, we cannot neglect what's going on at the global level if there's any hope for the future. Um, colleagues from Israel, Maus Fine and Danny Chernoff, were raising corals under those conditions of elevated CO2 that are expected into the future. Upper left-hand coral was the uh, upper left-hand corner is the coral when they started. Uh, to the right of that is what the corals look like under those elevated levels, and then on the bottom left is what they look like after they went back to normal seawater. 
So we know the corals will respond to elevated, well, changes in pH, and we know it can go both ways. Um, it was interesting as the coral polyps were still reproductive, but they simply wouldn't be around because the fish would eat them if they don't have their skeletons. Um, where we look at the intersection between science and policy, one very positive example was work that went on with the um, coral reef uh, symposium that we recently had, work that was done with the Center for Ocean Solutions, uh, were the group that brought it together. Um, the uh, Terry Hughes, who is the convener from uh, the Australian Center for Research Excellence and the Coral Reef Society, of coming together and getting 3,200 scientists to agree on the issues that were most important. And we came up with a consensus statement on climate change in coral reefs. You can find it online. But to me, it was a huge step forward to be able to get a scientific consensus. We know other groups have been doing the same, but it's been a very powerful document in moving forward to bring science into the policy realm, and we use it now with Association of Pacific Island Legislators, Council of Micronesian Chief Executives, Pacific Island Forum, to back them up. They're willing to take a stand on the policy as long as they know that there are scientists willing to back them up and they're not going to leave them out uh, hang to dry. So this has been a good step forward. Um, the way in which we're looking at this from a big picture is some work I've done, again, with Eric Olansky, our modeler. Um, this is basically my entire life's work in one slide or less. So it's always good to know that everything you've ever done for the last 40 years, you can do in one slide. Um, it's showing empirical data from the year 1900 on the lower axis, the x-axis. We have years from the year 1900 to 2100. And on the y-axis, percent coral cover for 261 reefs for which there are very good data. Uh, you can see originally from 1900 down to 2009, uh, we went from a uh, mean 80% coral cover down to 38%. And then from there is the predictions from the model. Um, the red line shows that if everything stayed as is, uh, that we would be at 10% or below by the year 2070. The 10% line is actually an artifact of the model that we use. Um, but nonetheless, it's showing that those reefs at that point are no longer coral reefs of any value. Um, if you add global warming, um, using a very conservative estimate, uh, for those of you that know the IPCC 2A scenario, that's the yellow line showing the same outcome but about a decade earlier. Um, the fork in the road on the blue, green, and the purple lines show if we do local integrated watershed management, and we have empirical data to show on many of these reefs, when you stop the coastal degradation, you in fact go from the decline of corals to recruitment, and then the recruitment, we start to see corals coming back. But the prediction is that's only going to last so long. And then once again, global climate change between ocean acidification, sea level rise, and global warming. Uh, we have two trajectories. The green one is with the warming. The blue line is when we start to add the acidification parameter. And my dear buddy, Eric Olansky, who's a wonderful modeler and a great human being, said, OK, we're done. Let's publish. And I said, are you nuts? What you've basically done is given every policymaker in the world a roadmap to say there is no hope for coral reefs. You know, turn off the lights, lock the door, let's go home. Um, so I insisted, and he finally gave in to my badgering, let's do a scenario where we actually continue to do things at the local level, and we actually make some headway on global climate change, and alas, we have the purple line. So we basically have five modeling scenarios. And these are, again, models are not going to give you an exact number. They can show you trends and trajectories. But what they basically show that if business is as usual, we're not going to have reefs. Um, local level efforts are really working, but they're not going to be enough if we don't deal with things at the global level. So what have we learned from that? Um, this is something I tell myself every morning when I get up. Ugly is good. Um, is if we take a look at our efforts at coral reef protection and for many other ecosystems, we often look at the most pristine or the best ecosystems to keep. But what we've learned from a lot of our work is a lot of marginal environments. In Palau, this large estuary is really a bad, bad environment for corals, yet we have genotypes that are doing just fine there. Uh, we recently had a big molasses spill in Honolulu Harbor. And uh, the data that uh, my students collected when they went out, I was just amazed at how much good coral was there before. And so we know that these marginal environments actually may have genotypes that are going to be extremely important for the future. So don't just think about the good places. Think about the places that do have a level of stress. We've also learned that the importance of building local and regional capacity. Uh, here are two of our colleagues, Stephen Victor and Yim Nang, who I mentioned earlier, Eric Olansky in the background. The two in the front were able to translate the science at a level that Eric and I never could. By being Palauans who can speak Palauan, who can work within the community, any successes that we have, and I think we have had some moderate successes, are really due to their ability to take the science and put it into a form and a format that can be culturally accepted. 
um, efforts. We've been funded by the National Science Foundation to try to translate this into curriculum materials for the six regional community colleges, and we're developing a very strong cohort of culturally connected individuals that are making the changes that are necessary. Many of their relatives are either traditional leaders or elected leaders, so it's not only having the ability to get communities to understand their own issues much better, um, they're already got a very solid basis in traditional ecological knowledge, but they never had to deal with things like organophosphates in the past. So this educational push, um, some of which ASLO has been wonderful with their minority diversity programs, these are really paying off. Um, if we look at policy making as kind of a buffet table with a little bit of science, a little bit of this here and there, um, I'm often really disturbed that science may just be kind of a condiment or a side dish. Policies are made on politics alone without the foundation of the science. Think Spamosubi. And so what I'm promoting is, you know, food is a good analogy, um, that the sciences, including the social sciences, including traditional ecological knowledge, including economics, really need to be the foundation for any sound policy. And that politics are going to enter into it, and that's just the reality of life. But perhaps politics can actually be the garnish that act makes things happen. And that's something that is, remains to be a challenge. And as soon as anybody figures it out, please let me know. Um, there are better opportunities than ever before teaching scientists how to be better communicators. And here's just a list of a few. CWEB, uh, Communication Partnership for Science in the Sea, um, Aldo Leopold Fellowships. Uh, ASLO has done a great job with the programs that uh, they've done for Capitol Hill visits, AAAS. And here's just a small selection of books that I force my students to read in my seminar showing how you can be a better communicator because if we can't explain to people why it matters, we're going to continue down the same path. Um, to finish up then, we see kind of this idea of goals and objectives on one side, scientists doing their thing where there's peer review publication, promotion and tenure, managers have a, uh, a legal authority, uh, we have stakeholders that are looking at quality of life and policymakers in the Western Pacific that are looking intergenerationally and in Washington DC are looking at two years, four years and six years. And you know what I'm talking about, House, Executive Branch, Senate. Um, so we have two very different worlds, but the goals can still be the same. If we start with our goals and objectives and work backwards, what we found as a success, uh, successful model is asking what can science do to help us achieve these goals and objectives? What do the management capacities do to help not only enforce existing laws, but make them something that the community can fully engage in? Um, the stakeholders can really drive the bus in this case, and in many cases in a democracy, they determine who's on that bottom line, and that's an area that we really need to focus in on is how do we get policymakers to use the science, recognizing that they've got a lot of things they've got to take into account, but the science really should be most important and foundational. And this basically summarizes then the science and management together, which have been working hand in hand, still need to do a better job of moving over into the policy realm. And science has the additional value of being able to then come back and help us evaluate whether or not these policies are actually working, making them living policies that can feed back into the science. We know on the left-hand side, the top-down approach has failed miserably. This kind of Venn diagram of bringing them all together has had a better rate of success, uh, at least for now. And to end by saying, it really requires partnerships. Um, I work with groups I never, ever intended to, like the Army Corps of Engineers. Those are some of my most close colleagues at this point. Uh, we work with uh, economists. We work with cultural practitioners. And even we see it in the science that's reflected here. It's impossible for anybody, no matter how smart you are or how smart you think you are, to be able to have a handle on all the different sciences that are out there. So being able to partner with good people and then being able to partner with policymakers and develop that trust and respect uh, certainly within the Pacific Islands, is one way that things seem to be getting better. So I'll finish by simply saying that this is a great opportunity for which I'm extremely grateful. I also want to acknowledge the, the wonderful support from NOAA, uh, Pew Environmental Group, National Science Foundation, and my cast of uh, colleagues and students that make this all possible. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few minutes for some uh, concise questions and concise answers. Uh, there are some uh, microphones somewhere. Where are they? Uh, okay. In the center aisle, there's a, there's a hand out. There's a hand. So come to a microphone, ask your question, raise your hand so I can see you if you're at a microphone. 
I see a, a hand up way, way over there on the side. Is that a hand up? Ask your question. I'm sorry, I couldn't I, hear that. No, you'll have to use a microphone. It's, oh. While you're coming to a microphone, do we have a question over here? I have the species of grouper. Come see me later. I'll give you the list. Okay, in the, uh, in the red shirt, yes. If you have a conservation question where the science isn't conclusive, and you're sure that something needs to be done, but you can't simply say, let's do what the science tells us, what do you do then? Can you give an example of that or just tell me what your perspective on that quandary yeah. is? Um, I think the best answer, and of course as a scientist I'll waffle, but, but the bottom line is um, the way a scientist looks at a question is with a p-value of p equals 0.1 or p equals 0.5, and the typical answer that managers get very frustrated with is a scientist that will say, well, I can answer that question for $5 million in five years, I'll be back. That's not going to work. Uh, managers have to make decisions within six weeks on a permit, and what they're often looking for is a p-value of 0.3, if there's a 70% chance. So in that case, we use what's called the best available science. You look at what knowledge is available, you be able to work with a group of stakeholders that are locally knowledgeable, and you come to say, this is what we think is happening, this is why, and then be able to come back and do adaptive management that if you try to address and it doesn't work, you don't keep doing the same wrong thing, you come back and try again. Thank you. All right, thank you. Right here, red shirt. Uh, that was a very nice talk, thank you very much. Uh, my question is, or asking you to comment on, is how to deal with the science of skeptics. You say uh, you know, how important uh, foundational science is. One of the books you show was Schneider's book, I think, on <laughs> contact sport. Uh, would you like to offer any advice about how to deal with science skeptics? Okay. Um, I guess two answers. The sarcastic one is the NRA doesn't allow us to worry about guns yet, so there's still an option there. But if you don't want to take that option, uh, what you really need to do is to recognize where it's not even worth the while. Um, that good science really does matter. And to put it into terms that people can understand, if someone goes to a doctor and gets a bad diagnosis they don't like, they have liver disease, they have cancer, it makes sense to go to a second, third, or fourth opinion. The IPCC has over 3,000 opinions at this point. At what point does it no longer become even worthwhile to talk to people that are the skeptics? Um, part of it is the argument and what motivates them. The strongest arguments that I've seen for the skeptics have not been scientific arguments for climate change. It's been economic arguments. In Hawaii, the argument I make when people say, well, we're not really worried about sea level change because we're a high island, I say, remember, there's 14 million people who live in Miami that are going to be displaced and they're looking for a warm place to live they start riding their skateboards to work the next day. So look at motivation and then look at where you can actually have an effect and where you can't. <laughs> Over here. Thank you, uh, brilliant presentation. Uh, one of your earlier slides, one of your early slides showed a picture, I think it was of the uh, uh, US Congress. <laughs> and uh, I was wondering how do you scale up to uh, much more, your, your examples of, of introducing science into local solution uh, space was with small communities, island nations, very homogeneous cultures, deep traditions. How do you scale that up to a society like we have in the U.S. in general, which is very, very heterogeneous and, and doesn't have, in many cases, of those deep cultural roots that you can rely on? Yeah. Um, the short answer is after 25 years of doing it, I haven't a clue. Um, the longer answer is a lot of times, to the extent possible, building trust with individuals, and not necessarily the principals, but with the staff members. That's usually where you get the best traction. If you can find out staffers who have been there for a while and understand how it runs, it's amazing the more time I spend in Washington, the more I realize that the people sitting in that building at the front desks are not the decision makers, it's the staff. It's the 25 to 35 year olds, and there are a number of bars where you can find them at night. <laughs> so you really, there's a number of ways of doing it, but it is the mystery, and I think that's the mystery that we really have to put our minds to, is how do we do the consensus. Basically, it's through the electorate, and to me, the informed electorate is the best way to go, but that's a long haul. Thanks for the question. Sorry for the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, you mentioned working with stakeholders, and uh, that's, a, that's a, a huge group, as we well know, but taking it back to the local level, uh, what would you say, uh, you in, in terms of stakeholders, what is your largest turn on the investment? What group of stakeholders do you see at the local level you would get the largest turn um, return on the investment 
working within this, this, the groups that you talked about. Um, from my personal experience, the real action that I've seen regionally is through the Plow and Women's Groups. Um, these are the groups that have the most traction, and they do interact with women's groups elsewhere, and that's no surprise. They're the ones looking at the longevity, the intergenerational impacts, et cetera. And in the case of Plow, it's very interesting. It's a matrilineal society. The men hold the title because the women own the land, and if they don't like some of the decisions, that changes fairly quickly. Um, so working with the women's groups in Palau, they stopped the Compacts of Free Association seven times, took on the State Department and won, turned away a Japanese super port in the 1970s. Traditional leaders are extremely valuable, and that's the advantage of working in the Pacific Islands, is if you can develop partnerships and trust and respect with traditional leaders, that you know, from science to policy implementation, two weeks in Palau was amazing. And then a lot of it is peer-to-peer, -peer, and I really have to say that it's my students and my colleagues who are of that culture that are really making the difference, and as we get these cohorts of culturally connected individuals, it's only going to get better. Uh, and one final question, right here. Whoop, I thought you were a question. You're not. You're a help the question person. Think of a question. <laughs> all right, thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you, Bob Richmond. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.